Uh, so thank you for the invitation. It's it's very exciting to be engaged in a conversation with practitioners and with uh, people who are really engaged in the front lines of this evolving security landscape in Africa. I wanted to focus my comments today on uh, the role of sort of lower level locally embedded violence specialists. And I use, I'll use i use this term violence specialists many times over the course of the talk. And what I mean by that are non-state actors can be more or less organized uh, that provide security to citizens. And they often do this because of fairly weak state provision of security. And these are an actor that I don't think we've concentrated on enough and they are contributing to what I see as an erosion of the rule of law in many countries across the region. And I think that greater attention to these kinds of actors will lead us to different ideas about policy going forward. So to begin with, I want to do a couple of things in the talk. I first want to talk about three different interlocking uh, elements in this security landscape that we're all facing. Two, I want to point you towards two data sources that are available, publicly accessible, and I think would contribute a great deal to the intelligence that you're working with in, in terms of not just what kinds of security threats that you're facing, but also uh, the public attitudes of your own populations. And then I want to talk a little bit about these non-state actors that I referenced before. Just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from, I've lived and worked extensively in a number of African countries, but I'm generally seen as a Zimbabwe specialist. I'm trying to become a Nigeria specialist, although that is a very complicated country, so it may take me a while. And I've also lived and worked extensively in Kenya. And so those are the countries that I can sort of speak to um, in the question and answer period with most specificity. But I, I've also done field work in other countries as well, and so you know I, I can talk about others. So first of all, to start, these three interlocking elements of the security landscape. First of all, I think a lot of our attention is, is very much focused on conflict zones, so active conflicts with formal state challengers, whether those be Islamist insurgencies, rebel movements, you know, actors that have some kind of military capacity. And obviously when we look at Central Africa, when we look at Somalia and the Horn, when we look at these emerging transnational security threats in the Sahel, those are important features of the security landscape. Uh, I think that there's there are some changes that are going on in that arena. So certainly when we look at the last 10 years, I've been struck and I think many people who focus on civil conflicts have been struck by the increased transnationality of these threats. And so you, um, I understand you've been talking about cooperative security or security that involves cooperation amongst regional actors and international actors and really sees domestic security as part of a larger regional problem. And I think that's exactly the right way to go about this. But there's a second element that I think that we need to think about both on a transnational level and also on a domestic level. And that is the general erosion in the rule of law that I think we've seen really starting about 20 years ago. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, part of that is, and I, I should say, there's a lot of variation across the continent. So we certainly do have some countries that have dealt with delivering the rule of law, really policing and monitoring their populations much better than others. And so there's always variation when we're talking about these things. But I think overall, when we're talking about the region, the reason that we've seen this kind of erosion of rule of law is, first of all, because of the rollback of the state that we saw with structural adjustment. So there was just suddenly, starting in the 1980s, a lot less resources that states had to work with. They still had to supply health. They still had to apply, uh, they still had to provide education. They still had to provide security, but they were dealing with much smaller state budgets. And um, that certainly is something that's contributed to this erosion of rule of law. Second thing, we do have particular forms of democratic competition 
Um, you know, in my bio, we reference that I work on election violence. So again, this is not all elections, but we certainly know that in some places, election competition and the tactics and strategies used by politicians have created security problems for your security services, both military and domestic policing. And in some cases, politicians have actually created actors or created the challenges that really work to erode this rule of law and provide space for the emergence of anti-system actors, insurgencies. Um, you know, obviously, if we're thinking about Nigeria and, and, and Kenya, we have to we have to think about those factors. And then a final sort of driver, I think, of this erosion that we're seeing across the region is climate change. So in the question and answer, I can talk more about the way in which I see that working out in Nigeria. But when I see the security challenges that we're facing in Nigeria, a lot of that does have to do with the loss of fishing livelihoods, uh, the erosion of coastal areas, increased salinity in arable areas, all of those pushing farmers northward. Whereas we have deforestation, uh, increased desertification in the north, pushing herding populations south. It's not surprising that we see greater and greater conflict in the middle portions of those countries where those two populations meet. The third element of this, so that's erosion of rule of law, lots of different drivers that we can talk about more. The third element are these non-state actors that I already talked about. And I think it's very important to see the, the sort of proliferation of these actors as really a response to the weakness of the state. So we're not talking necessarily about actors that are formally challenging the state, trying to take over territory, or trying to overthrow the government. Instead, we're talking about, sometimes this falls under the rubric of community policing, Sometimes this falls under the, the tag of ethnic militia. Sometimes these are just your, in Nigeria, they're called area boys, sort of block level organizations that provide security to their communities, but also are often involved in criminal economies. And I think if we look at the past 20 years, we've seen an enormous proliferation of these actors, some of which remain focused in individual communities or individual regions, but some of which have become increasingly sophisticated and are now really criminal organizations that benefit from this eroded rule of law and have an incentive to keep African states weak. So I, I want to talk more about those in a second, but let me first talk about this data that I referenced that I think can be a, ref, a resource for you. So the first, first of those is uh, ACLID data. This is, oh gosh, I don't know what that acronym stands for. So it's uh, armed conflict and local engagement data, maybe. Um, but if you Google it, you'll find it. There's an entire website. Also, I do have handouts. They weren't translated in time to be projected, but those handouts will show you a map that generates, using this ACLA data, what the actual spread of violence on the continent looks like. What I like about this data is you can work with it in a lot of different ways. And so it's locally disaggregated. It also codes individual conflict events by date. So you can look at the evolution of trends in violence in a particular area. You can go down to the regional level inside countries. And it also tracks civilian violence committed by insurgent groups, by other actors. And you can bring up, using this data, you can generate reports on individual violent actors whether it be Al-Shabaab in Somalia or Boko Haram in Nigeria. So this is very valuable data. Are there problems with it? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not going to really give you every single violent event inside a country. But it's compiled from the same source data that the U.S. government often uses for its intelligence. And so it's compiled from news wires, from human rights um, organizations' reports, from other kind of unclassified data sources. And so this is a very rich kind of data on actual violent events and lots of disaggregation. The second data source that I wanted to bring up is Afrobarometer. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, this is an independent, nonpartisan, started out as an academic organization, but it now um, sort of has a policy element 
relies on local African partners who are, again, nonpartisan, works with African academics. It's very locally rooted in the continent. And what it does is systematic, high quality polling now in uh, 34 countries in the current round. Started in 2000, 2001 in just 12 countries, but it's expanded its scope over time. And this is really the only reliable public opinion data we have on what Africans really think. What I wanted to bring up again, and you'll get this in the slides, is this crisis of sort of rule of law rising patterns of crime. And so we know from some UN, um, some data from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime that the homicide rate in both Latin America and in Africa is twice the global average. And so we know that homicide and crime is a real problem in African countries. We also know from the Afrobarometer data that in these 34 countries that they sample, 24%, one in four Africans, reports that they feel very unsafe when walking around in their own neighborhoods. We also know that victims of crime, those who experienced crime according to their own responses, vast numbers of them did not report that crime to the police. So overall in these 34 countries, in terms of the victims of crime, 56% of African victims of crime say that they don't report those crimes to the police. And generally, this is because they don't think the police can help. Some countries, even countries that don't have massive problems with violence, civil violence, like Togo and Benin, were up to 79% of crime victims not reporting to the police. So there is a real problem of sort of policing and internal security. And I would argue that that's what leads people to then invest in these non-state actors who can become problems over time. So to give you a sense of what these look like, um, you know, there's wide variation. And I think often the easiest example for us to grasp onto are ethnic militia. Usually these are organized in rural areas. Sometimes rural areas that have experienced problems with cattle rustling or other kinds of just crime and property destruction. And so local communities will sort of band together to create their own security in the absence of effective state policing. In the beginning, these organizations can often be very accountable to their populations. And so they actually are being paid by populations and they actually provide security. In Lagos, a, a city where I work and know very extensively, we know from my own survey data that more than 70% of slum dwellers in Lagos rely on vigilantes to provide for policing. And over 70% of those people pay them some kind of fee for their services. So certainly these organizations are providing roles in policing and security that the state, yeah, most African states are not effectively providing to their populations. The problem, though, is they're not states, right? So they don't have to remain accountable to their populations. And gradually what you see happening, certainly in the, in the cases that I know best, is there's an evolution in these organizations. They begin to become more predatory. They begin to ask for more and more and deliver less and less to their populations. And over time, they can become involved in criminal economies. So one of the ethnic militia in Kenya that I know very, very well, Mungiki, basically follows this process entirely, starts out in rural areas, being accountable to its local Kukuyu communities, moves into Nairobi, takes over the bus routes, becomes a criminal organization, is then banned by the state, and they sort of move into the slums in targeted repression aimed at getting rid of Mungiki. Has that military-style repression in Nairobi slums worked? No. The organization goes underground. It becomes more sophisticated. It becomes much harder to uproot it. So my general sense on this is we need to look at the drivers of, of this declining rule of law and the real problem that we're seeing where communities, totally not their fault, trying to provide for their own security, form actors that can then later on really be problems for states. So I just want to close really quickly, and if the chair will just indulge me for a few moments, I want to talk about what this means for policy. So 
first of all, you know, I, I think that the direction that we're going with really thinking of security as a regional um, problem that needs to involve a lot of different states and international actors, that's certainly a, one thing that we need to be doing. Another thing that we knew, do need to be doing is talking about investing in domestic policing and building up strong and effective and impartial police forces that obey human rights and are embedded in their local communities. And I think for a long time, we've been reluctant, I mean, and I'm speaking here about US government and other foreign governments, to work directly with the police, because the police are often seen as illegitimate. They're often seen as involved in human rights abuses. So we've seen a lot of involvement in uh, regional sort of capacity building in terms of militaries, but policing is often ignored. Now, is that easy to do, to build up strong, accountable, good quality police forces? No. I mean, it's, it's hard to really do this. And certainly those of you who've been watching the news from the United States know that we still have problems with getting our police forces to obey human rights and to respect local communities and to treat citizens all the same. So this is a long-term process, but I think it needs to be foremost in our agenda. The second um, policy that I want to point to is that we need to sort of think about security as part of a larger process of building up state institutions. So I'm so glad that um, Ms. Cook focused so much on this idea of a social contract. But certainly that's what we need to be talking about in terms of improving the security situation and building a stronger rule of law in African countries. And I think that maybe some of the way in which we're thinking about states is a little bit misguided. So certainly right now, um, we still have a lot of development assistance that is not passing through state bureaucracies. Instead, it's going to NGOs. Um, those of you who've driven around in rural areas, you'll often see that new schools and new clinics that are paid for with development assistance have the US flag on them rather than the flag of African governments. If we are serious about making populations believe in the state, then we need to actually see African governments providing services to their populations, not just policing, but also education and health. And what my research on taxation shows is if you start providing those kinds of services, citizens are much more willing to pay taxes. They're much more willing to turn to the state when they have problems with crime. And I think that means they'll be much less willing to turn to these non-state actors that I hope have con I've convinced you are problematic. Okay, thank you.